Okay, hey everybody, tech- Oh, I caught it on the first try! Woo! Alright, we're keeping this take. Alright, I don't even care if I mess up for the rest of the review, we're keeping this take. Alright, before we get into the intro, uh, I do have some announcements to make, okay? So, the announcement is as follows, alright? Uh, uh, okay, see, that would have been a cut right there, but we gotta keep it because of the pen, okay? Alright. So, I, uh, I'm doing a popularity poll on my channel right now. We're doing the best One Piece arc and the worst One Piece arc, alright? And so, I made a video about that. A couple of days ago, or you could skip that video. It's not really important. It's just me doing a Troy McClure joke from The Simpsons for most of it, okay? Down in the description of this video, I'll leave the links for the best story arc in your opinion and the worst story arc in your opinion. Uh, I've had way more votes on the best story arc rather than the worst. It's not an even number, and that makes sense to me because I can feel like a lot of people are looking at it and they're just like, I don't have a single arc in One Piece that I would deem as the worst. They're all perfect, and that's a viable strategy. Okay, but those are down there. Also, since we're talking about popularity polls, I wanted to bring this up. I wanted to bring this up in like a lot of videos, but I just keep forgetting. So uh, Artor actually uh, made me aware of this. Uh, there's a thing called the Pirate Gala One Piece Creators Award Show, and it's an award show. It's in Spain, and it focuses a lot on One Piece content creators. Now, it's mainly uh, the Spanish-speaking One Piece community. Uh, however, there is an international category, so you can go and I'll put that link below in the description to vote for your favorite One Piece content creator internationally. Vote for whoever you would deem as the greatest YouTube international One Piece content creator. So there you go. That's that. All right. That intro was not the best, but I caught the pen and that's all that matters. Okay, let's do it again. I did it again. Oh my God. Do I just have a natural... Okay, I don't. I don't. All right. All right. Video time. Okay. Talking about God Valley. You know what I'm, I'm thinking right now? I don't think this should be called the God Valley Incident. All right, this this is not an incident. When you actually step back and you look at all the big players that are going to be present at God Valley in this flashback, it's not an incident. It's a damn war, okay? If Marine Ford was classified as a war, which honestly I don't know if Marine Ford should have been a war. It's more of just a battle, you know. It was like one day. It wasn't like an overly drawn out war. I mean, then again, God Valley was also during one day, I would assume. But th th that's my point, okay? You don't hear it being called the Marine Ford incident. Ah, yes, the Marine Ford incident. That one time Whitebeard rocked up with a bunch of his allies and challenged the Marines directly. Yeah, no, no. It's the Paramount War, or the War of the Best. It's a war. If that was a war, God Valley was most certainly a war. We got rocks. We got Roger and Garp. That alone should qualify as a war. Like, let's take away everybody else. Not even involving Sheiky or Whitebeard or Big Mom or anybody else. You put rocks, Garp, and Roger, you just drop them on an island and have them fight? That is classified as a war zone now, okay? So there it is. I, I kind of feel bad for Kuma. I mean, I feel bad for Kuma in general. But, like, this is supposed to be kind of set up as Kuma's backstory, right? But it involves God Valley. So it's, it's going to be kind of like Odin, where, yeah, we're getting Odin's flashback, but I think the best part of Odin's flashback that most people paid attention to was less about Odin and more about Roger, because we actually get to see the Roger crew and, and arriving at Laugh Tale, and then the reaction of Roger laughed. I mean, it's like, oh, yeah... Odin is also in the background while all that's happening. But, but you know, this is this is the main thing, right? So I feel like we're going to have something similar with Kuma. And it makes sense to me. I mean, we're entering, we're, we're in the final saga now. Who knows how long that's going to last. So Oda has to start revealing things. We got to start seeing a lot of these flashbacks. We got to start seeing what, what's happening. And God Valley is one of the most hyped ones. Um, the first time this was really brought up, I mean, the first time Rox was mentioned was like right at the beginning of Wano. It was right at the Reverie. It was like 905, 906, I think the first time Rox was mentioned. Uh, God Valley was brought up, I think it was right after Act 2 of Wano when Sengoku was discussing it with all of the uh, the Marines and everything like that. So this is this has been well over 100, 150 chapters now in the making for us to finally get to this point. Um, so we got to reveal it. So yeah, it will be Bartholomew Kuma's backstory. He's there. Ivankov is there. Ginny is there, who's my, most likely uh, Bonnie's mother. We'll, we'll We'll be having that stuff in the background as they make their dramatic, daring escape, um, you know, out of God Valley. But, dude, Rox, Roger, and Garp, and plus Whitebeard, Big Mom. We also got 
the big reveal. This is the thing I'm most excited for. Oh yeah, it's gonna be Wang Ji. I don't know, let, let's hear some Wang hype. Come on everybody, Wang Ji! Yeah, it'll be cool to see, you know, Whitebeard in his prime doing some cool stuff. It'll. I actually do want to see some stuff with Kaido. I know we just spent a whole arc with the guy, but uh, we kind of skipped over his flashback a little bit. And I think the reason for that, I think it was two main reasons. Number one, I think Oda knew that he was going to be doing the God Valley chapters, you know, coming up in the next arc in Egghead. So he's like, all right, uh, you know, Wano already is pretty packed. It's a pretty bloated arc to begin with. So let's 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 reduce down Kaido's backstory. We'll get the rest of that in the next arc in Egghead. We'll do the flashback to God Valley. So that was one reason. And uh, the second reason I think was like, yeah, honestly, just like the fight with Luffy. If we did a long protracted Kaido backstory in the middle of Luffy fighting uh, uh, Kaido, it's like, okay, we're going to take five chapters out of this to focus on Kaido's and how he grew up and everything like that. So, yeah, because God Valley is such a big thing, you can't really show all of it. If you're going to show all of it, it has to be at once, and that's going to be several chapters, all right? That's not just going to be, like, one chapter you could fit all of God Valley, all right? So, yeah, that, that makes sense there. So, I, I do want to see some more stuff from Kaido. I want to see how he got the Devil Fruit. Um, that was something I saw Artur post about on his Twitter recently. He basically made a long list of every single Devil Fruit that may or may not be at God Valley. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. But no, yeah, I'm excited for Wang. I want to see Wang Ji. I can't wait until he actually shows up and he'll be like, oh my god, we did it! We finally made it! It's Wang Ji! Oh my god! <laughs> you know? And he's going to be the most amazing, marvelous character in One Piece, let me tell you. I don't know what gimmick that Oda has planned for Wang, but I'm, I'm behind it 110%, let me tell you. Okay. So, uh, yeah. We have, uh, also, we have Garling. We have Garling, who's a member of the God's Knights, but then we also have all the other God's Knights. Now, this would probably be like the earlier rendition of the God's Knights. Uh, maybe there are some members back during God Valley that are still members today. Uh, if Garling was in like his 20s when he was, you know, at God Valley, so because he looked like a pretty young guy back in the day, all the other Tenrobito were like fawning over him, like, oh my God, Saint Garling, he's magnificent. Oh, you know, be still, my beating heart, right? It was kind of like that. So, I don't know. Let's let's say Garling... Let, let's highball it a bit. Let's say he was like 30 during that backstory. I don't think he was at 30 at that point, but let, let's say he was my age. He was 30. Okay, so that was 38 years ago, which means right now he would be around 68. And if you look at the way he looks during the recent chapters, uh, yeah, yeah, late 60s, you could kind of buy that. He looks comparable to like, um, well, you know, Vegapunk, that's the thing. Like Vegapunk looks, I think, a little older than 65, uh, but he is a scientist. He is rather stressed out. So uh, maybe that, or, or maybe Garland, maybe a little bit older than that. Maybe he was in his mid-30s at God Valley or something, but I, I'm putting him somewhere around mid-20s, something like that. So, who knows? Maybe we'll see some members of the God's Knights back then, and we'll see them here in the present, and then some new members that have joined in the last, like, almost four decades, right? So, they're going to be involved in this, too. It's it's not just Rox, Garp, and Roger. It's like the God's Knights are also going to get involved in this fight, so keep that in mind. So, um, a lot of people have been actually discussing, like, why Rox was attacking the island. Okay, like, why did Rox... Because Rox was the one that initiated this, right? I think the idea was that, yeah, the Tenrubita were having their extermination tournament here on the island. They started the games... And then Rox decided, like, Rox, this was his plan. Like, he was planning this for a while. He's like, ah, oh, yeah, the next time that the Tenrubito have one of their games, that's when I'm going to get involved, all right? Now, I, I've i seen some people say that, like, Rox attacked so to free all the slaves and things like that. And I'm like, all right, I don't really feel Rox was that altruistic. Now, the one way I could look at that is... Rox attacked the island, freed some slaves, and to, to, like, have them join his crew. Like, that might be a thing. But I don't think, uh, Rox was all about the humanitarianism with this. I don't think Rox was like, attack the Tenrobito and free all the slaves because I am against it. You know, I, I don't think Rox... Rox seemed to be, like, the way he was talked about in the lens of Sengoku and Garp, who, to be fair... They are Marines, so they would have a, per a particular bias for this. Uh, but it, the way that we talk about Rocks, it's like he's in, he was an evil son of a bitch. <laughs> it seems to be the impression here, okay? Maybe he wasn't. Maybe Rocks' personality is completely different. I think Rocks, honestly, when I think about him, I, I think he was just insane. I think he was this, like, like take Luffy and then dial him up to, like, a hundred. All right? Like, even more so than Luffy is right now. Like, Rocks was a guy that was insane, but was also 
also crazy strong, and so people kind of had to follow him. Also, maybe because of the Davy back and everything like that. Just like, hey, everybody, let's have a fight, and who, if you lose, you gotta join my crew. Haha! -ha, bam, bam, bam! All right, you're joining my crew. Oh, look, the Tenrobito over there. Let's charge and fight to the death, boys! Woo! You know, like that. That was rocks. I feel like that's gonna be Rox's personality. Like someone absolutely insane that uh, just loves bloodshed. <laughs> okay, like dialed up to a million. All right. That's gonna be rocks, right? So he attacks the island and his goal at the end of the day was to be king of the world How you have to have a couple of screws loose just at the offset to want to be the legit actual no bullshit King of the world. All right. I'm be king of the world. All right So yeah to have that dream to begin with you got to be a little crazy so I think he's like, all the Tenrubito and the God's Knights, they're going to be on this one island in the West. We could get to it. It's not hard. All right, we could get to that island. We could get on there, and we could just slaughter all the Tenrubito. And then there's no one else at the top. Maybe Rox knew about Eam, and he knew about the Empty Throne and all that. Maybe he didn't. But, he, you know, I think the idea is like, oh, the Tenrubito are there. Let's just cut them all down. Not because it's like, oh, the Tenrubito are evil and they're corrupt and they have slaves. And I will slay all of the Tenrubito to free all the slaves and free the world from this corruptness. No, I think it was more just all personal for Rox. It was very selfishness. Like, it was just, I'm going to slaughter all the rulers of the world. And then I become the ruler of the world, and I get to rule with an iron rock's fist. You know, like, that that was his perspective on that. Now, you look at the other members of his crew, like Whitebeard, for instance. I don't think Whitebeard would have been all game for that. I don't think Whitebeard would have been like, hey, man, calm down. I don't want to be king of the world. But the idea is that Whitebeard was on Rox's crew, so they, they probably had a Davy back, and that's how Whitebeard joined. That's probably how Big Mom and Sheiky, because it was, it was mentioned that they were a very motley crew that, like, fought constantly on deck and when I say when they say fought I don't think it was just like they had arguments like Sanji and Zoro do every now and then and even Sanji and Zoro's arguments get a little heated I'm talking like they probably came to blows to the point where like you know Shiki said something to Whitebeard and then they start clashing on deck and there's blood and shit and it's like oh man like they're actually trying to kill each other right so they ended up on this crew together not because they wanted to but because they had to I suppose it was also mentioned to be a big money-making scheme so, who knows? I mean, the Rocks Pirates were definitely a thing before God Valley. It wasn't like they got together at God Valley j just for that one job, okay? Uh, although it might have been a thing. It might have been a thing where they were on Hachinosu. Maybe that was Rox's island, and so Rox was letting them stay there. He's like, okay, you could stay on my island, my awesome Hachinosu, my full of lead island, but in exchange for me, like, letting you live here in lieu of rent, <laughs> you gotta be part of my crew kind of thing, right? And they maybe they weren't, like, always active, but it was like whenever Rox got an idea in his head, like, you know, get together, everybody. We're going for the big score. You know, it's like, okay, well, we got to do it because Rox is letting us live here. So we got to get moving, right? It might be something like that. And this was just one of those. This was the last big score of the Rox Pirates, okay? So, yeah, we got Rox, Big Mom Kaido, Shiki, Captain John. A lot of people forget about Captain John. I think it's because Captain John was, we saw his zombie. We saw his corpse at Thriller Bark, although that was just a shadow of the man. Uh, the real Captain John probably would have been a lot stronger and a lot more, like his personality was a little different because um, he was like an alcoholic and super lazy at Thriller Bark, but that would have been the shadow's personality that animated him. That would have been Captain John's actual personality. So, you I know, mean, the real Captain John probably wasn't a drunkard. Okay, might have been something different. Uh, we also have Silver Axe. Nobody talks about Silver Axe. Uh, but I'm assuming he probably wielded a Silver Axe, but that's all we know about him. Uh, and then, of course, we have Wang, and I'm really excited for Wang. I think Wang liked to use rifles because the actual historical Wang Ji introduced uh, rifles into Japan. Uh, he was the translator along that Portuguese vessel that brought uh, rifles into Tanigashima, and so that's that's the whole idea. So, you know, I think I think he was, like, one of the best marksmen in the world before Yasa before Ben Beckman, uh, it was Wang. That was the greatest sharpshooter in all of the... Before Verona, it was Wang. That was the greatest sharpshooter in the world. I, I like to think that's the case there. Okay. 
So, uh, yeah, those are the people. Also, we have, uh, oh, uh, Miss Buckingham Stussy. Forgot about her. Uh, the original that would have, I guess, been part of, of, uh, of Rox's crew. And also, I guess, Higuro Rashi, because Higuro Rashi was uh, the, uh, you know, grandmother of Orochi, uh, you know, Higuro Rashi Kurozumi. But she was out traveling for a little while, and she did have access to a Devil Fruit ability. So maybe, you know, she was also part of this. Sami Maru as well. I guess you could throw Sami Maru and Higuro Rashi in there. Now, they were already old people during Odin's flashback. I'm trying to think here for a moment, the exact timelines of all this. They would have been, like, they would have been a little younger, but not by much. Uh, yeah, because I think that whole flashback with Orochi when Higurashi came back to Wano and presented the, um, the, um, mythical zone, the, um, Yamato no Orochi to Orochi, um, yeah, I don't think that was very long after God Valley. That was, I think, after... It was either right before Odin left with Whitebeard. So Odin left with Whitebeard. That was 30 years ago. Okay, God Valley was 38 years ago. So it was somewhere in between that, 38 to 30 years ago. So Higurashi and Semimaru probably would have looked very similar while they were uh, at God Valley, if they were there. Now, they might have joined up. In fact, I think it's confirmed. They did join up with Rox's crew long before God Valley. Because Higurashi and Semimaru, I don't think were on Wano when all of the shit hit the fan. Pretty much probably as soon as Orochi's grandfather that did the whole thing, tried to kill the daimyo, and then the Kurozumi clan was, like, about to be, you know, punished and everything like that. Um, so, w with that being the situation, I think then Higurashi and Semimaru fled the island, ended up out in the world, and that's when they joined Rox. That could have been, like... 45 years ago, 50 years ago, they joined up, something like that. And then after God Valley, they had nowhere else to go, so they returned to Wano. That's when they met Orochi and everything like that. So, yeah, they would have probably been on the island as well. So, let's talk about Devil Fruits here, all right? This is something that I kind of just forgot about, but if you think about it, the Ten Rubito have this messed up practice of taking Devil Fruits and feeding them to slaves for their own sick amusement, okay? Because we know that happened because that was Boa's uh, flashback, her and her sisters. Boa Hancock was force-fed the Love Love Fruit, and then her sisters, Sanderzonia and Marigold, were force-fed the uh, Snake Zones. The um, uh, It was the Anaconda and the, uh, was it the uh, King Cobra? Was Marigold the King Cobra? I think it was the King Cobra. Yeah, so it was different, like, zones, and then Boa had the Paramecia, okay? So we already know Tenrubito do that, and now we're on an island where the Tenrubito are having this big hunting tournament, and they're, they're not only hunting the natives of the island of God Valley, which was a non-allied nation, but they are also releasing a bunch of slaves and criminals that were, like, troublesome slaves that, like, tried to fight back or tried to uh, escape. Okay, so Kuma, Ivankov, Ginny, they're, they're a part of that group, okay? So you got to look at this. Like, we don't know where Kuma got his devil fruit yet. Kuma does not have his fruit at this point. I don't think Ivankov has his fruit at this point. Um, um, so maybe they get their fruits here. I mean, it, it's it's possible. Um, also, the fact you got to think about it. Like, if you just step back for a moment, a lot of the people that are on God Valley right now end up with some redonkulously powerful devil fruits. Whitebeard ends up with the strongest paramecia in the world that could possibly destroy the entire world, and we don't know where he got it. You know, uh, this is this will be one of the youngest we've ever seen Whitebeard. I mean, we saw Whitebeard when he was a little kid at uh, at Sphinx, but he definitely didn't have the Guru Guru no me back then. All right. And then by the time Odin's flashback starts, he already has it. OK, he had to have gotten it at some point during his teenage years or in his 20s uh, and 30s. And that would have that would have been in the moment of God Valley. So this is like the strongest paramecia in the world. It's possible the Tenor Rubito got to gotten their hands on it because they get their hands on the strongest devil fruits because they have the biggest like network all over the world. And uh, it might have been a thing. Uh, this is actually really messed up when I actually think about it. But we saw that there's a point system, right? on God Valley, like, okay, so the God's Knights and the Tenrabito are going out and slaughtering people, and they get a certain amount of points, depending on who they beat, okay? But that wouldn't be fun for the Tenrabito, for just the God's Knights to go and slaughter everybody. Because what, what are normal civilians on the island gonna do? What are normal slaves gonna do against the God's Knights, right? So, in order to keep the fight interesting for the Tenrubito, keep in mind, this is all painted with an extremely dark, messed up lens here. But in order to keep things interesting, what if the Tenrubito, because they're the Tenrubito, they're like, we have scattered devil fruits all over the island. Maybe you find one, maybe you eat it, and maybe it's strong enough to help you get off the island. Like, giving the slaves and the criminals, like, 
like 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 a, a thread of hope, like a chance. Like, oh, maybe you can get a devil fruit. Maybe it gives you the ability to fly. Maybe it gives you the power to to, to teleport. Who knows? We don't know. You eat a devil fruit, and maybe you can escape. Maybe you could beat a god's knight, right? That would also be something I could see Garling being a fan of. I could see Garling being like, yeah, because it wouldn't be fun otherwise, right? You know, so it's just like, oh, yeah, scatter some devil fruits around. See who eats what. Maybe they could actually be a challenge to me. And I'm sure they do this every single tournament. And you might be wondering, why would the Tender Veto be so stupid? Why would they do that? Well, this tournament happens like every three years. So they've probably done this so many times before in the past, and it's never been a big deal, especially with how strong the God's Knights are. Uh, because when you really think about it, even if you eat a really strong Devil Fruit, you're probably not going to know how to manage it and use the powers right away. Like, I don't think as soon as Kuma ate the devil fruit, he would instantly be able to, like, use Ursus a shock and all the advanced techniques that he uses later, right? Okay, so even if they did this before, here's what probably happened. They scattered devil fruits all over the island, wherever the execution, the extermination execution tournament was, and then some slaves and some criminals might have gotten their hands on them and eaten them, and he's like, okay, I have a devil fruit power now. Oh, what's this? Oh, it's the pawpaw fruit? What, what, what can I do with this? And then Garling or, or one of the God's Knights shows up and just cuts off their head, and then the fruit just gets reincarnated anyway. You know, it might have been something like that. And maybe the world government figured out the method to, like, reincarnate a fruit so they know right where it is or, or something like that, maybe. But um, it's never been a big deal before. It's always been there. And it's, of course, the Tenerobito are so haughty. They're so up there on their ivory freaking palaces that they're, like, devil fruits to them are just like, oh, a devil fruit. Yes, feed it to the slave, dear. That would probably be interesting. Let's mess with them, you know? You know, let's feed them devil fruits and then submerge them in the water and laugh when they drown. <laughs> you know, that's the kind of they're they're so so arrogant to the point where it's like they don't view it as like maybe this could come back and bite us in the ass all right this was the first year it came back and bit him in the ass right so i'm assuming that's probably how kaido at least got his dragon fruit that's probably what happened there big mom at least stole that and then she's like i found a devil fruit it's a mythical zone and then kaido was about to die and she gave it to him because they're like oh okay they're like you know brother sister kind of thing they're looking out for each other uh and so he's like oh here here's the fruit okay well you owe me a life debt now boy you know something like that okay so that's maybe how that situation went but yeah kuma could have gotten his fruit ivankov could have gotten his fruit um, there's some other really strong ones, like, uh, Whitebeard's Guraguranomi, Nomi, the Orochi, the Yamato no Orochi fruit, uh, Shiki's Float Float fruit might have been there, a lot of them could have been there, right? Okay, so that's just, that's the situation with that, right? Um, let's see, then, then we have Roger and Garp arriving, so I'm thinking that, like, what if Rocks attacks... And then all of the Tenerbito, they send out a distress signal, right? And they're like, you know, Rox is attacking God Valley! Send the strongest you can! And so Garp receives the memo. What if Garp was fighting Roger while this was going on? Like, it's somewhere else in the world, in the Grand Line or something, because the West Blue does border the New World. What if it's a situation where Garp and Roger were just fighting, like it's a normal Tuesday or something like that, right? He's like, ah! How you doing, Garp? Ah, it's been a while! Roger, I'm trying to to bring you in. It's like, ah, you will certainly try, and then I will twirl my mustache at you, and then Garp and Roger are just clashing on a regular island like they normally do, and then Garp receives a distress call, and he's like, hey, Roger, time out. I got a call. He's like, yeah, our matey! Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, all right. All right, take five, everybody. All right, you know, Rayleigh, fetch me my chair. <laughs> It's just, it's like, Scopper, good, good work out there, Scopper. Yes, give me some whiskey, yes. And so they're just chilling out in the background. It's like a wrestling match. Rayleigh comes over to Roger. He's like, you're doing great out there, Captain. You're doing great out there. I know it. Ah, he's tough. You know, Roger's got like a black eye. Garp like punched him square in the face. And Garp's like, he's like, he's got a little slice across his chest from, um, from Ace, uh, from Roger's sword. And they're just having a, they're just having like a boxing match, but it's really messed up or whatever. Anyway. So, Garp gets the phone call, and he's just like, Yeah, what do you want? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, God Valley, huh? It rocks is attacking. Oh, man. That sounds, like, pretty intense. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. Oh, the God's Knights are there? Oh, he's killing the God's Knights. All right. Okay. Oh, boy. That's that's not good. Okay. Hey, Roger, we're going to need to take a rain check today, man. Oh, that's bullshit, matey. I was going to win this fight. He's like, well, Rox is attacking God Valley. I'm a Marine. I got to go fight. Oh, why are you listening to those damn Tenro Beto? They suck and you know it. He's like, yeah, I know, but I'm a Marine. I got to do it. He's just like, well, screw that. I'm coming with you. 
You can't show up. I'm a Marine. You're a pirate. We can't just show up. As a I'll tell you what. You think you can handle rocks and that motley crew of his by himself, matey? By yourself? And just like, I'm yeah, okay, come on. He's like, all right, matey. We shove off everyone to the Oro Jackson, you know? And then they have their little trip through the comm belt, and it's like, you know, Sea Kings are coming out, and Garp's just casually punching out Sea Kings, and Roger's just slicing them. They're just having a conversation as they're going to the West Blue. And then they get there, and then they arrive, and then that's when the big fight happens. Like, I would love for that to have been the situation, where Garp and Roger were already in the middle of a combat, and then it's like, oh, we gotta go. It's like, oh, no, I'm not taking a rain check on this one. I'm going with you. It's just like, I'm not, I'm not passing up a chance there. I've been, I've been meaning to show Rox my... Uh, uh, test my metal against him for yars. You know, all right. That, that, that made sense to me. I like that. Let's let's go with that. Oh, man. How long is this video now? Oh, we're getting close to like 30 minutes. I think that's I think that's a pretty solid God Valley discussion war video here. Um, yeah, and then they get there, and a, a lot of Tenrubito are going to die. A lot of them are going to die. I don't think any of Rox's crew, save for Rox himself, um, die here, because, uh, Captain John dies later, he gets his, his knees him, and then that's when he dies, Wang Ji might be dead right now, but I don't think he is, he was, he was set up at Hachinosu before Blackbeard, so he was ousted by Blackbeard, that doesn't mean he's dead, I guess Silver Axe might have died, <laughs> poor Silver Axe, uh, but obviously Kaido, Shiki, Big Mom, they're all still alive, uh, Whitebeard after the, uh, events of God Valley, so Rox might be the only major casualty from his crew here, and it might be because of his own hubris, he might have just gotten to the point where he's just like, all right, everyone, we're staring down the Marines and Roger, who's with me, fight to the death! And then, it, like, Rox turns around, and there's just no one there. Like, they just all abandoned him. They're just like, we're not, we're not fighting to the death. We're done. We're leaving. Whitebeard leaves. Kaido, Big Mom, they all leave. And then he's like, well, I guess it's myself then. All right, everyone, let's go. I can take you myself. And then Rox just charges forward, and then Garp and Roger use some awesome combo attack and kill him right there and finish him off, right? I, I think Rox is going to be dead. I don't think when Garp was talking about him, he was like, if Rox actually came back, but if the crew ever came back, if a level of crew got formed together with that power, then they wouldn't be able to handle it, okay? So in that scenario, yeah, Rox is probably dead now, um, just like Roger is dead, but the will kind of carries on through Blackbeard, and so Blackbeard might, you know, rival Rox with that level of power, okay? So that's, that's the point, all right. Anyway, that's the video. Hope you enjoyed. Make sure to follow those links down below for the worst and best One Piece poll that I'm doing, and then the uh, One Piece Pirate Gala Creators Award Show. Uh, you can go check that out as well and vote for whichever content creator you would like. Um, and so now I guess we could just lead on into Zebra Facts, everybody. Yeah, Zebra Facts. Zebra Facts, Zebra Facts, I'm so glad this is almost done, we're on Zebra Facts! Alright, so today we're going to be talking about the three types of zebra. So, we got, uh, they're all in Africa, and we have the plain zebra, we have Grevy's zebra, and we have the mountain zebra, okay? So the largest out of all of these is Grevy's zebra, named after Jules Grevy. I don't know if I'm pronouncing the last name correctly, but uh, he's a man that's most famous for having a zebra named after him, I guess. I don't know. I like his mutton chops. It's pretty cool. This is the largest one. It's also referred to as the Imperial Zebra. Then we have the middle-sized of the three. We have the Plains Zebra. These ones have the broadest stripes. They also have a lot of subspecies uh, involving the, uh, one of them is actually the Quagga, which is a uh, extinct subspecies of zebra. So we'll probably tackle the Quagga later on in another zebra zebra fact, okay, but it is a currently extinct uh, subspecies of zebra. And then finally, we have the smallest out of all of them. We have the mountain zebra. The mountain zebra is uh, noticeable because it has a very uh, distinct dewlap or like a little bit of a hump on the back of it. You can kind of see it right there in that picture. It's not super distinct. It's not as distinctive as like a camel or something, but uh, there's a little dewlap. There's a little bump back there you can see, and so that's, uh, that's the mountain zebra. So there you go. There's your three types of zebra. Good night, everybody!